Hi, good morning. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special webinar series celebrating Women's History Month. My name is Linsa, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager at NimbleWork and your host for tonight. Today kicks off our three-part webinar series where we'll delve into important discussions surrounding women in leadership roles. At NimbleWork, we believe in humanizing work, where diversity and inclusion are at the core of what we do. There's no better time to highlight the voices of remarkable women leaders than during the Women's History Month. Uh, joining us today is our special speaker, Christina. Christina is a powerhouse project leader with over 15 years of experience. She's worked at some of Canada's biggest tech companies and now runs her own successful consulting firm. Christina's journey from corporate leadership to, to entrepreneurship is truly inspiring. Welcome, Christina. Hi, thank you. So before we dive into our discussion, I want to encourage everyone to participate actively. Feel free to ask questions, share your thoughts, and engage with us throughout this session. Also, before we start, a quick note. The views shared today are based on our personal experiences and perspectives. Opinions may differ, and that's okay. Our aim is to spark dialogue and share insights. Uh, now let's get started. The topic for today's webinar is Be Seen, Be Heard, Building Your Brand as a Leader. This session focuses on empowering women leaders in project management. We'll explore how to identify your unique strength, build a strong brand, and use communication effectively to lead with impact. So with that said, Christina, uh, let's start with a fundamental question. How can women leaders identify their unique strengths and position themselves authentically? Well, I really think that starts with yourself and you have to have a strong sense of knowing yourself and what your strengths and weaknesses and your gaps and your limitations are. And that can be done by doing a lot of, I would consider it to be self-reflection or looking inwards. So knowing in which circumstances you feel comfortable, maybe speaking up and voicing your opinions or voicing um, a position and in other situations where you're not, if there's certain topics you may feel more comfortable speaking about or not. And there's also a variety of assessment tools that are out there that um, you can Google. There's lots of online assessments or formal kind of more formal assessments that you can do that can really help you identify what your strengths and weaknesses are. But I think the key thing when it comes to women and being and, and speaking authentically is really uh, the key is being authentic. If you try and portray yourself as somebody that you're not or somebody that you don't feel comfortable with, it will come across as not being authentic and not being natural. So if you're an introvert, for example, there's nothing wrong with being an introverted. If you can find your voice and being an introverted, that's fine. Uh, being authentic and having a voice as a woman doesn't necessarily mean that you're the loudest person in the room. It may just mean that you're contributing the most to the conversation. Right. Uh, but I think, Christina, uh, as women in the real world, when we put our voices in a way, we are targeted as bossy. We are labeled as uh, someone who is me. So what do you think as women we should be uh, doing right to not be labeled that? Well, I think there's only one thing that we can control and that is how we present ourselves how people interpret us or respond to us is not necessarily our responsibility. And I think as women, because naturally maybe it's because we're seen as the roles as, as mothers and wives, as nurturers, that we tend to take responsibility for, or we wanna take responsibility for a lot of things. But I think as women, it's important that we have control over ourselves and our actions and our voices, but how people interpret our voices is something that we may not necessarily have control. We might be able to influence and maybe our tone of voice or choice of words, but ultimately how people interpret us and how they uh, interact with us is their behaviors and their choices. And I think as women, I think it's really important that we come to that conclusion that there are going to be people, regardless of how we present ourselves or the tone of voice, that will interpret us as mean or bossy. And that's just the way, unfortunately, that they're going to view us through their lens. What I think we can do as women, though, is try and present ourselves in the best possible light that we can. 
So that's making sure that we're speaking with confidence, making sure that we're speaking with authority and making sure that we're speaking um, and we're um, presenting ourselves in the best informed manner that we feel that we can. And however people want to interpret us, that is up to them. And there'll always be people who will interpret women. And it's the same for men too. There will always be people who will interpret depending on what a man has to say as maybe being arrogant or aggressive. And, and it's the same thing. A man, a man will most likely say, well, I can't control how people like interpret me or how they respond to me. It's the same kind of things. But I think as women, we're, we tend to be maybe maybe a little bit more sensitive and that we want to take responsibility and we want to make sure that, you know, as naturally as caregivers or whatnot, that everybody is okay. And I think we need to, in a way, just worry, you know, there's the expression, worry about yourself. I think sometimes that's not women. We need to really do, we need to be more mindful and just present ourselves in the best possible light. And however people interpret us, if they interpret us as mean or aggressive or, or, or bossy, then that might just be how they're viewing us through their lens. And unfortunately we don't have the ability to um to change or really um you know or or to ask or demand that people change their their lens we can influence them we can encourage them to change their lens but we ultimately don't have control over that right uh, right so uh talking about uh, uh how we put our voices so communication plays a vital role in leadership how can a leader effectively express their values and strengths through communication so one of the foremost things I think a leader has to do is really have an understanding of the audience that they're dealing with and being able to cater to that audience. So as female leaders, that's really understanding and knowing the culture of the organization and who we're dealing with if we want to um, come across as authentic and we want to create the brand that we're uh, that we want to to do so that's really it comes down to relationship building and being aware and noticing things and as women I think naturally we are very perceptive and our analytical skills we, we women we, you know on a lot of assessments when we do formal skills assessments things that we come out really good and high and oftentimes women score really big in perceptives. So we can easily read how people are interpreting the information we're communicating with. And we also have the ability uh, a lot of time to build relationships with people. So I think those are two strengths that as a female leader, um, in order to get, uh, you know, how we communicate and to get our messages across is really key strengths that we should be focusing and really playing, playing up on and playing to our advantage. Right, right. Um, I think empathy is also one of the best uh, our best uh, tool that a woman has. And empathy is, is a very powerful means uh, to communicate in leadership and, and a very important aspect of a leader. Can you share an example from your experience where empathy helped you achieve uh, project goals? Yeah, so I had an experience at an organization I worked with um, a couple of years ago with a product. Um, it was a product marketing uh, colleague of mine. And I noticed in meetings, he um, it wasn't that he wasn't necessarily participating in meetings, but he was a little bit unresponsive. So I wanted to get down to, okay, why exactly is I'm sensing this sense of unresponsiveness in the communication? Is it because they are not interested in the topic that we're talking about? Is it because they have a lot of stuff going on? What exactly is it? So the key thing about empathy is having an understanding and making an effort to understand the position of others. So I took the approach of having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to actually try and understand, like, there seems, you know, there seems to be a little bit of reluctance to, to interact with the team and to communicate. And I really um, tried to, to ask some probing questions to kind of get to the bottom and to understand, well, why is the reason, why is this? Is there anything that we can maybe do to improve it? And I ended up finding out that the person, it's not that they didn't want to um, collaborate or they communicated, they really just didn't like um, being what they call put on the spot to answer questions in meetings. They would have preferred maybe some more preparation time, some more like advanced knowledge of knowing what questions maybe would be asked or what areas they'd be asked to update uh, the status of, of, of work that they were working on a little bit in advance. And then the so when I realized that, it's like, okay, this person, they do want to communicate, they do want to collaborate, but maybe they just want to communicate and collaborate in a different way. Mm -hmm. So 
or by really fo forcing myself to, okay, have an understanding of maybe what this person is dealing with and is going through, I was able to set up um, meetings with this person ahead of time and be ahead of the larger group meetings where we did align and they kind of had an awareness of what questions they would be asked, what they would be asked to update. And then they ended up being a very great um, communicator and collaborator, but it was really taking that initiative and understanding. And they actually thanked me afterwards, the fact that I did make that effort to understand and not just assume that they didn't want to communicate and collaborate with a larger team on the project. And it actually was very beneficial for helping the team to move forward and meet our project objectives. So sometimes it is, um, you know, having empathy, it's having that understanding, but it's also being able to ask the right probing questions and being able to listen to, to what people are saying. Right. Uh, so do you think empathy as an attribute can result in sometimes not being a good means to communicate with someone or uh, we as, as, as a leader, we would want to be empath empathetic to someone, but that results in something that, uh, I mean, we wanted to give our, we wanted to do our part, but then the, the other person did not respond it well. So have you been in, in, in such situations? Well, in a situation where maybe the level of empathy or the understanding that you're, you're, you're trying to, to exhibit, and maybe if the person isn't matching it, I think you really need to stop and maybe look at some of the root causes of why that might be. And one of the things to have that kind of relationship is that people need to feel that they have psychological safety. So in order to maybe um, open up and be empathetic to, to a leader and what they're trying to do, or maybe understand the position of a leader, maybe team members need to have the psychological safety to feel that it is okay to do so. And if they do ask a leader questions, or if they do try and understand the position from uh, a leader may be coming from and ask questions to get to that point, they need to feel that they're in an environment where it's comfortable to ask those questions and where they feel that they're not going to be perceived as questioning the leader or challenging authority. They need to feel that it is part of a dialogue. And in order to have empathy, you do need to ask questions. You do need to ask questions to get the game and understanding. So I would um, pause and maybe try and consider like, why does this person not, not why are they not opening up or why are they not the, the level of empathy that I as a leader in giving, why are they not matching or giving in return? And it might just be because they don't feel the comfortable enough in that environment or that space to feel that way. So this is where building relationships, building things where you have a culture of trust, accountability and respect can go a long way to also building um, relationships where you have empathy. And especially for leaders too, leaders need to be aware that there may be some mistrust for employees if they decide to open up uh, to their leader. Um, and so I think leaders need to be um, proactive on that and really build that culture and make people feel safe. Okay. Uh, so recognizing and leveraging our strengths are crucial in project management. How can women leaders in project management identify their unique strengths and values? So one of the key things um, I think is, is having that awareness of perce uh, perception and the efforts that you're giving on your projects, where are they best well received? So for example, if your team really appreciates the fact that things are organized and, and people know, for example, like the project plans are updated, people know the status of this, maybe that's a cue that one of your strengths is your organizational and your project planning skills. Likewise, if you're hearing feedback from the team members and stakeholders that they really appreciate that there's no communication, that communications are clear, that everybody seems to be collaborating, maybe your skill set lies in your communication skills. So it's oftentimes being having awareness of how what the actions you take, how they're being received. On the flip side of that, if you are doing something and you're finding that people aren't being really responsive or it's not being received positively, maybe that's a sign that uh, it may be something that it's a gap and it's a, an, a, an awareness uh, or something that you maybe need to improve on. And the other thing is to uh, think as a project um, manager, um, for all project managers, regardless of the gender you identify with, I think we also have to be open to receiving feedback. 
So ask your team and they will tell you uh, if you have a good, you know, open, honest, um, you know, relationship with your team, they will tell you maybe where some of your strengths and weaknesses lie as well. And I think you need to listen to those, but being perceptive in the absence of actually getting formal feedback from your team or from your stakeholders, just being perceptive about what's going on and how people are interpreting your actions. And sometimes those can give you the cues to see like, you know, where your unique strengths and where your, um, you know, maybe some of your gaps or weaknesses lie. All right. Uh, what are some common challenges that women leaders may face in building their brand in project management? So I think as, as women, and maybe this goes back to kind of um, the natural, some of the traditional roles that women have been have been um, kind of involved in as caregivers, as mothers, as spouses, um, we tend to maybe want to do everything. And in project management, there is a lot of things <laughs> that, that need to be done on a project. But, and sometimes we try and give the feedback, feedback and guidance to our teams that people can't do everything at once, which is why we have tools like work breakdown structures and we have things like racy charts where we have, you know, kind of the clear um, accountabilities and responsibilities, who's doing what. I think in a way, as project managers, as women, we also need to be aware of that too, of taking on too much. Um, and trying to do too many things at once, trying to do too many things as once as a project manager, again, regardless of your gender, will get you into a lot of trouble. Um, but doing too many things at once for a woman may often lead to burnout, which is something that as women, we really do need to be mindful of because I think in a majority of um, circumstances and in cultures, women are still in the role of a primary caregiver outside of their professional roles. And women often have a lot of things going on inside of our roles. So within our professional uh, you know, roles and our professional work, we don't wanna also be taking on too many things to burn out. So I think one of the things that, that as women, um, one of the challenges we, we may have is delegating, is being able to appro appro um, appropriately delegate tasks and again, this comes with also coaching and mentoring and developing your team. If you have a team that is fairly, uh, you know, make capable and they're able to self-manage, this becomes an easier task. But um, if you're struggling with a team that maybe their skill set or their skills or maybe their own personal preferences, that can be a bit of a challenge. So I think delegating and not taking on too many things um, onto your plate is is a challenge that women have because you want to be seen uh, as a as a woman in project management at excelling and that excelling is going to come from maybe one or two or three things that you're doing uh, and there's only realistically two or three things in project management that you're going to do really well and project management by its nature you need to be good at everything but i think as for women to build our brands we need to be exceptional at a couple different things and figure out what those couple of different things are and do it really really well so if it's managing stakeholder relationships we need to do it well if it's planning we need to like master it and do it really well and if there's other things we can learn to delegate I think we need to learn how to do that. Agreed. I think we as women, we have, uh, we want to be considered the Wonder Woman. We want to be mm -hmm. perfect at our work, perfect at our personal lives, and because of that, as you truly said, we 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 burn ourselves. We overdo mm -hmm. things. We we make we want to do everything and want to perfect it. So I completely completely agree with you. Um, so one last question, what advice can you, like one advice that you would give to women leaders in project management? I think uh, the one advice that I would give to women leaders is really know yourself and know what your strengths are, but also be very mindful of your gaps and excel at what you are good at, but at the same time, be proactive and have a plan in place for working on your gaps. Because I think as women, naturally, I, I do believe that project management is one of the fields that women 
if, you know, if the circumstances and the environment are right and the desire is there, can truly dominate this field and be um, leaders. And I mean, women are leaders in other environments outside of the, you know, the, the professional environments that we're in, fraternally in, you know, in many um, cultures in many parts of the world, women are leaders at home. So there's no excuse and no reason why we can't be leaders in, you know, in the boardroom or in corporate settings or in professional settings. But it really is knowing what those strengths are and knowing yourself and being able to really capitalize on those strengths and play to those strengths. So that may be, involve a little bit of soul searching. It may involve be, um, a lot of reflective time about figuring out what you're good at and really capitalizing it. And at the same time though, as much as we can capitalize on our strengths, we really do need to be mindful of maybe those er weaknesses or areas that do need attention and also put in um, not just 100%, I would be putting in 150 to 200% to try and get better at those areas as well, because we really do have the opportunity to excel. I mean, I think women naturally are, are, are you know, are excellent at things like project plans, um, project planning, our communication skills, organizational skills as well. We seem to do it in so many other um, areas of, of our lives and our personal lives. So taking those skills and knowing what you're good at and applying it, I think a lot of women have the opportunity to really excel in, in their fields. Just one last question. I, I this is this is a, a personal question from my side. Uh, so creating a support network is crucial for success. Uh, can you share tips on how to build strong uh, allies, both within our own organization and external? So we as women, we to make our voices heard. We need support of the people. So do you have any advice on how to build such allies or such yeah. support? So I think it's really um, to, to network. Um, and this might be more natural for some people than others. So I realize that some people might have a little bit more of an introverted personality than an extrovert, extrovert or personality. But I think you do need to put yourself out there and you do need to build relationships. and get into a bunch of different environments. So whether it's professional networking kind of events where you attend, maybe it's online, maybe it's for things like extracurricular activities like clubs or volunteer work or activities that you do, or maybe even in your professional and the professional context, it's volunteering for um, you know initiatives inside the organization that you may get an opportunity to network and interact with people outside of your team or outside of your function or putting yourself up and volunteering yourself to take on tasks. I think women, we need to put ourselves out there and to build your network, you need to find people that will become, well, I call them your people. And so these are the people that, as you said, you will identify with, they will have similar views, they will support you, they will help you learn and develop and grow, they will challenge you when you need to be challenged. But ultimately, these will be the people that, you know, will become your network. It may take you some time, but when you find that group of people or that network or those people who, uh, you know, will support you and become your ally, you will know when you found those people. So I have a, I am, you know, an example outside uh, for one of my hobbies. Um, I actually found a, a community of people who helped me develop and grow on a social media app. So in this, in this case, in the social media app, we interact with each other and they provide me with the support. So it could be, you know, physical networking events that you attend, it could be volunteer opportunities, it could be through social networks, maybe joining, um, you know, a, a social network and joining a group that, you know, uh, that aligns with your profession, um, you might be able to find people who are going to support you and help you develop and grow. But it does involve being bold, taking a risk and putting yourself out there. And as project, um, you know, managers, women, we understand all about risk management. So we understand the probability and the outcome if we do certain activities and stuff like this, but the probability that you may fail, it might be there, but the outcome of it, of you succeeding is extremely high. So if you were to do your probability in impact matrix, you will find that, you know, this might be a high risk activity, but also your outcome, your expected um, kind of reward here is also very high too. If you put yourself out there and if you join networks or you build relationships with others and they become your network around you, you'll find that the reward is oftentimes greater than the risk. All right. Uh, thank you, Christina, for sharing your valuable insights and expertise with us today. So now we are open for any questions that you guys might have.
So if you have any questions, just, just uh, put it in the chat box. We will take it up. So I think there's a question in the chat. Would would you like to to read it? Are you able to see? Because I am not able to see the question. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I'll read it. Okay. So in many cultures, it is mainly the men at home and even at the workplace who need to support women's participation in leadership roles. However, in general, it is upon women themselves who need to drive themselves per, per, um, professionally, uh, state um, that what they need um, to do and not fall victim to the commonly accepted norms of women's places, caregivers and homemakers, would you agree? So I do think that there is an element of women needing to identify themselves as leaders. And that is definitely one thing to be a leader. You oftentimes you have to want to be a leader. So history is filled with people who were successful leaders, but happened to just because of circumstances fall into that role. Um, so I do think that there is a responsibility for women to identify that yes, they wanna step into a leadership position and be proactive, but oftentimes, there may be circumstances or there may be environments where women may not even realize that moving or transitioning into a leadership role is even an option for them. So that is where we, we still do need um, male allies and other allies in the environment that if you see, um, and this is for both genders, this is not gender specific, but if you see people with leadership potential, you should make an effort to identify those people and do what you can to support them. And more often than not, what we find is that that happens to be women who uh, are identified as potential leaders. And then once they are, and once it's presented to them that this is a viable career path and they would be a good fit, then I think there is obviously, you know, an interest in, but I think we also, um, you know, do need allies and the support of others to also kind of identify those opportunities that may not be visible to just, you know, to men and women, if there's leadership opportunities. Um, okay, I think there's the second question. Um, sometimes a um, few men feel that supporting women or empowering women is against them men. What would you like to say about it? So in, um, in my corporate professional career, the majority of the environments that I've worked in have been male dominated environments. So I have a technical, uh, a tech, um, you know, a corporate background where I've worked for, as, as was mentioned at the beginning of today's session, in some of Canada's largest technology companies and the environments that I worked in are particularly male uh, environments. And as much as, you know, we, we have initiatives to grow with the participation of women in STEM fields, uh, mostly, you know, fine for a variety of organizations, smaller tech companies to the large global multinationals, they still are skewed to women being a minority in these workplaces. So it is vital for women to be successful in all um, organizations that we have the support of men and others who, who don't identify uh, with a gender. So for men, um, standing for equality and standing for justice and standing for equal opportunities, it should not be viewed, and my advice to men is that it shouldn't be viewed in the context of man versus woman, it should be viewed in the context of supporting everybody. And if everybody is part of the organization, then it is really looking to advance everybody. It just so happens that women just happen to be a smaller number of that everybody, but you're really looking to support everyone. So as much as we can see that, you know, some of the historical strides that have been made for equality have been, it has been women advocating for them with obviously the support of some male allies, they have advanced societies and they have advanced, uh, you know, um, you know, other policies or the circumstances for society as a whole, for everyone to benefit. So there is something for, for men, it shouldn't be viewed as supporting women is, it's, is not supporting your own gender or, not, or it's gonna be at a disadvantage for you. It's gonna be something that it benefits ultimately everybody within an organization or in a team. Right. So is there any other uh, more questions, Christina? 
Um, I'm seeing a comment here. So I've been fortunate to have had strong role models um, in women in my family and friends network. I wonder um, if it might appear as presumptive or condescending for men to support women or speak up on their behalf. They probably just um, just to get out of their way and let them thrive. So I don't think it's presumptive or I don't think it's condescending for men to, to speak up um, for women and to certainly advocate for women. Um, I've often appreciated, especially in, as I mentioned, I currently have been in male dominated environments where sometimes um, I'm the only woman in the room. So it's very easy to be ignored if you don't speak up. So I've often appreciated where if I haven't had an opportunity to speak up, maybe it is a male colleague who has spoken up and said, oh, well, we haven't heard from Christina or if it's another female member of the room. I don't think that's presentive or condescending. I think that's giving an equal opportunity for everybody in a meeting or in, or, you know, in this case in, on a team to participate. Um, I do think that, you know, having strong male allies and having, you know, allies in general is helpful. I think having allies can be helpful for everybody. So, if, so for example, if you see people talking over and particularly, you know, this does happen in environments that I've witnessed where you might have male colleagues speaking over a woman, that same behavior can be done for anybody on the team. So having allies and having people speak up, it might just be that they're speaking up to support a woman, but they're speaking up for everybody on the team who maybe doesn't want to be uh, talked over or spoken over. So I, I don't think, personally, my opinion is I don't think that's presentive, mm -hmm. <laughs> presentive or condescending. I think that's trying to make, okay. advance and create a culture where everybody can feel that they're valued and of equal value. So we have one question, Christina. Uh, uh, how can we ensure that all voices, including those of women, are heard and valued in our project meetings and discussions? So what I personally have found is I personally have found using some um, tools that maybe it, it's something like a random picker that picks, you know, the speakers who will speak next to give everybody an equal opportunity. Um, I found that even having things like time boxes too, where we go around or maybe do a round table, like if it's a round table of this um, session and maybe having a time box so that everybody has an equal opportunity to present. So Unfortunately, that means that it does force everybody to participate in the meeting. Some team members may like that. Some people may not. But if we want to be equal, we, we need to give everybody an equal voice. But having something like a time box or using tools like that can also ensure that everybody has an equal opportunity. Um, sometimes, too, having things like um, in project meetings, maybe making an agenda available in advance and giving people an opportunity to maybe add things to an agenda can also make sure that people who who want to speak up and want to participate or advocate or bring forth an idea have an opportunity to do so and that it is actually planned and part of a formal kind of part of the meeting but yeah i found that going around and, and having a tool that maybe randomly picks the order of who speaks in in the meeting or what topics or who presents what has definitely helped to make sure that everybody has an opportunity and time boxing i think based on the, like when i've done project meetings has helped too because that ensures that everybody has a chance to speak. All right. Uh, so thank you, Christina. Thank you again. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, this concludes the first session of NimbleWorks three-part series on women leaders in project and product management. We hope you found it informative and inspiring. Uh, don't forget to tune in for our next sessions as we continue to celebrate Women's History Month. Uh, from all of us at NimbleWork, have a fantastic day. And uh, Thank you all. Thank you, Christina. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.